With Ireland's economy in such a mess, we're all looking for a way to make Ireland great again, to get our country back to work. Well, in this episode, we're going to look at some very real and practical ways to do just that. There's an emerging consensus that transforming Ireland into a green economy could be the ideal way to rebuild the country and generate employment. One of the things driving this consensus is that many experts and business leaders believe that rising oil prices will undermine Ireland's recovery. The world is changing faster than anybody realises. We've seen oil move from $70 a barrel last September to $100 a barrel today, and that's four months ago. So to see a 33% increase in the price of our basic commodity that keeps the world running in three to four months is incredible. Take India and China alone, for example, their populations now of 1.2 and 1.3 billion people, and they create a voracious thirst for energy. So the undeniable outcome is that we have no choice we absolutely must find alternatives to fossil fuels. German industrial and technology giant Siemens have been in Ireland since the 1920s. I caught up with the senior executive, Werner Krukov, to find out what this emerging energy crisis will mean. We did a study a couple of uh, months ago in analysing the impact of rising oil and gas prices for Ireland as a country. If the oil and gas prices reach values of $150, $200 per barrel, then Ireland will not recover in the next 15 years. So it's extremely serious. So it's time for action. The irony is that we actually have so much renewable resource on our own doorstep that we could be using, and yet we choose to be dependent on foreign resources. We spend about six billion a year buying energy from abroad. We could be energy independent here if we used our natural resource. Ireland is very rich in the wind sources, so this new technology development and spending on this is a huge business opportunity. So yes, this is a challenge to the government or to the community for the future, but actually this is a huge business opportunity. Ireland is fantastically wealthy in terms of renewable energy resources. We have plenty of land for growing bioenergy crops, an abundance of waste residues. There's lots of forest thinnings for wood energy and unlimited wave and tidal capacity in our seas once the technology is fully developed to capture it commercially. Despite our climate, we have the same solar intensity as Germany. And we have some of the most consistent and powerful winds in the world. However, we're currently importing 90% of the fuel we need at a financial loss of six billion euro every year. But by harnessing our green resources, we can generate up to 15 times more electricity than we need. Exporting the excess power to Europe could be worth up to 50 billion euros a year to the economy, enough to transform the country's fortunes. Over the last two years, despite the recession, some $300 billion worth of investment were made in the clean energy sector. That represents the single largest, fastest growing international industry into which Ireland can export uh, its technologies and its clean energy development. And if we choose, and if we create the right incentives and regulations, and if companies invest in an economically sensible way, I couldn't think of a better way uh, a more beneficial way to rise up from the banking and the economic crisis. So, you know, we, we just have to think outside the box. The new government is going to be faced with a big choice straight away. Are we going to continue to be the cork bobbing around on the ocean? Or are we going to take our own destiny into our own hands and put people to work here? Ireland could generate immense wealth from green energy and end our reliance on imported oil, gas and coal if we harvest our potential resources effectively. Before we look at how that might happen, let's look at another renewable energy that is available everywhere.
There's lots of talk about the rising costs of fuel and how we spend billions of euro every year importing oil, gas and coal. The thing is, if we really wanted to, we could be nearly entirely self-sufficient. And part of the solution is here, all around us, cow shit, and Ireland is full of it. Cows, sheep and pigs produce methane naturally all the time. What few of us realise is that this potent greenhouse gas could be an incredibly valuable fuel. Methane is a very valuable resource. It can be processed into biogas to heat our homes, fuel our transport and our power stations. It can save us a fortune in imports of fuel and at the same time provide us with many valuable jobs. Anaerobic digestion is a biological process that converts organic waste to biogas in the absence of oxygen. The slurry created by pigs and cows is gathered and fed into a sealed digester where it ferments. The biogas is then collected and stored in a balloon tank. Pig farmer Billy Costello has two anaerobic digesters in Germany and is now building one on his farm in County Kildare. We are an agricultural country. We have lots of pig slurry and cattle slurry. By using an anaerobic digester, you can take them in and you take all of the methane out of them and convert it into green electricity. Animal slurry isn't the only thing that anaerobic digestion plants can digest into biogas energy. Every year, we produce 650,000 tonnes of food waste. A large portion of this is dumped into landfill and creates leachate that, if released, will contaminate groundwater and emits methane that pollutes the atmosphere. This food waste could be diverted to anaerobic digesters to create biogas and save us a lot of the money we spend importing fuels. The wonderful thing about anaerobic digesters is that they're not fussy. They'll take any form of organic waste, household and commercial food waste, farm slurry, even render from slaughterhouses. And in Ireland, something that we have huge quantities of and that they really love, and that's grass. So far, Ireland has only a couple of biogas plants. So I've traveled north to the Agri-Food and Bioscience Institute, who've been studying the best mix between grass and slurry at their biogas plant in Hillsborough, near Belfast. The amount of biogas yield from one tonne of fresh slurry is very much less than that from one tonne of fresh silage. But the most critical thing in digestion is the volatile solids. That's what gives the biogas. Slurry is only about 8% dry matter. Grass silage is about 25% dry matter. Hence, we're getting to the reason why grass silage will give more biogas. So it's an absolutely enormous potential. Grass could replace a lot of the oil and gas we import. I wonder what Irish livestock farmers would make of that. I'm not an expert in the area, but I would always have a mind for an opportunity in any area where we can increase income on the farm. You're quite a big farmer and very successful. What about smaller livestock farmers? Is it difficult for them? It is, and when prices are bad, they're really under pressure. And there were a lot of people working part-time on building sites and on dry stock farms and whatnot, and those extra jobs now are just not there at the moment. Farmers are a fairly versatile bunch, and if they see something uh, that's promising and that looks like there's a future in it, essentially they want to stay on their farm and they want to make a living on it. According to some experts, farmers will be important bioenergy producers in the coming decade. I travelled to University College Cork to meet scientist Dr. Jerry Murphy to see what he thinks. What we have here is we have bales of silage. So inside these tanks, we have these. So we put grass in here. It makes a silage effluent, which is very strong. And we pass that up through that gas-making tank. And all the gas is there. So all our gas comes from this guy. Jerry is researching how to maximize the methane extraction from grass. We export 85% of our beef. And the farm family income for beef is poor. Farmers are not making money out of, out of beef. Um, so we're saying there's an alternative industry so if we could take some of those cattle and remove them and use the grass to make gas instead of meat, 
Now in Ireland, 91% of the land is under grass. So our viewpoint is agriculture has to be used for energy, but it has to come from grass. We produce all our own grass-based feedstuff. We make 200 acres of silage, so that would translate into about 3,000 tonnes of silage. So for anyone who had a smaller farm, perhaps the way forward might be to consider a few farmers joining up and forming maybe a miniature co-op, get together and pool their resources. We're doing some work with Board Gosh on this and that 620,000 houses are connected to the gas grid. We've looked at case studies in Bandon, for example, where there is a gas grid. So our concept is if there was a digester in Bandon and farmers in the locality could bring in their slurry into the mart and bring grass silage, and if they have some maize, bring maize, and have a digester in Bandon, and that gas will go into the gas grid and will be used in houses and will be used in transport fleets. One in four buses in Europe run on gas. So we could have Dublin bus running on Irish gas. So you've got security of supply, you've got rural employment, we are reducing pollution, we're reducing greenhouse gas. Many people might think using animal slurry, food waste or even grass to produce energy is either eco-nonsense or the stuff of science fiction. But many countries in Europe are already very successfully doing this. Germany, for example, has thousands of AD plants. I've been involved in anaerobic digestion on our farms in Germany for the last five years. It's very common in Germany, partly because the government made a decision a number of years ago to put a high feed-in tariff. The tariff is the income you get from the electricity company for selling them the electricity. So the Germans have set it at uh, the equivalent of 21 cents per kilowatt for a 500 kilowatt plant. They don't bother with other incentives. Their idea is give a sufficiently high tariff and the market will take care of itself and will make the investment. The Germans have recognised the importance of home-produced energy. We in Ireland can do the same. Doing so will require new feed-in tariffs set at a rate that will attract farmers and entrepreneurs to invest in renewable energy sources. Potentially, how much is there? If you take our grass in Ireland and uh, food waste, all of these things, how much could we generate here? In well, in Ireland has the third highest level of bovinity in the world. That's the ratio of cattle to people. So we have so much slurry, we could substitute for 40% of natural gas. There are so many upsides. We currently spend billions of euro importing 90% of our fuel requirements. This could be dramatically reduced. We could improve our environment, help farmers stay on the land, and create thousands of jobs at home. Building a network of biogas plants will make this tiny peripheral country more secure. Ireland is exposed to the interests of oil-producing countries who have no interest in our welfare. It's vital that we decrease our reliance on foreign fuels and create alternatives at home. Anaerobic digestion will be useful, but we've something else in even greater abundance than slurry waste and grass, and that is potentially far more valuable, wind. Ireland is facing its most difficult time since it gained independence. But one thing that can give us lots of confidence is the fact that the rest of the world urgently needs lots of renewable energy. Green energy has become one of the most important growth sectors in the global economy. And experts are convinced that Ireland can play a crucial role in the market. Two thirds of the planet is covered with water, right? Ireland is an island. So theoretically, as you start generating, there doesn't have to be a limit. Anything that's coming from the offshore wind or wave or water is totally unlimitless. So can Ireland become a major producer of energy? Yes, it can. And it really kind of depends what the people want and what the government want and whether they can put all the elements in place to start harvesting that energy. The whole world is looking at wind and renewables as the future and replacing fossil fuels and oils is cheaper, it's more reliable, it's available on our doorstep and we have much more of it than other European countries. In fact, we have amongst the strongest wind and wave resources in the world, only the southern tip of South America, uh, the southern tip of New Zealand and the west coast of Ireland have the strongest resources in the world. The idea of harnessing wind to generate power is not new. 
Ireland is already getting 13% of its electricity supply from wind turbines, like these built on exposed sites across the country. We could have far more wind farms were it not for the slow planning process, difficulties in connecting to the grid and delays in the gate system. Our public sector and utility companies could make an important contribution by deciding to only use green energy like that produced by our wind farms. Ireland could also make huge amounts of money from exporting excess green electricity. To achieve that, we need large banks of turbines built offshore, where we have an abundance of wind. There's 3,000 megawatts of offshore wind installed in the world at the moment. We've only got 25 megawatts. China are catching up, India are catching up, Europe it now has to take the lead, and that's the one message that now Ireland got when we were in Brussels a number of weeks ago. They have said, Ireland, you have a resource, and you've really got to go and convince your government and the state agencies to develop that resource at this yes. time. Oriel, a 300 megawatt wind farm off the coast of Dundalk, is waiting to generate 5% of Ireland's electricity, enough to power 250,000 homes and reduce CO2 emissions by 600,000 tonnes annually. But far more are needed. We have to find a way to build them faster. The problem is some commentators are saying that it's both too expensive to put in place and too difficult to stabilise the fluctuating energy to make it practical. There's a lot of iron and metal and copper in a wind farm, so therefore it is expensive. Uh, to build in the beginning. It probably costs 1.6 million uh, euros to put in every megawatt of, of wind power. However, that's the only expense. You hardly have to spend anything else from there on in. Now you have a free source of energy, so that after 15 or 10 years or 20 years, suddenly you have a no-cost energy source. Now this is unbelievably important. Wind is one of the cheapest ways of generating electricity and it actually reduces the price that we pay for all our electricity. We've looked at what's going to happen in 2020 and if we meet our targets, it's going to reduce the wholesale price of electricity by 11% over the full year. So wind can pay for the initial investment over time and reduce the price of electricity, but some ask, is it reliable? Well, the reliability of wind is the question that we have to address. Now, if you connect up, a huge big long area with a big grid. The wind is always blowing somewhere along that grid and you even the output of wind. So you can actually, by building a grid, which isn't very expensive in the, in the scheme of things, when you build the grid, you even out uh, the whole variability of an individual wind farm. So Ireland could become, first of all, it could supply all its own resources, but then we can start exporting great quantities to a power hungry Europe. Eddie O'Connor has been advocating a grid system for Europe that will connect wind energy to all countries' grid systems. The idea is now close to fruition. An east-west interconnector will link Ireland next year to the UK, allowing us to export green electricity to Europe. The European supergrid has the potential to generate vast wealth for us. The European supergrid will transform this country, but we need to have people starting to make the decisions today. Uh, in 20, year, 20 years' time, we'll, we'll be past the post. They'll, they'll be t taking energy from elsewhere and we'll have missed the boat. Two countries already well ahead of us are Denmark and Britain. This year alone, the UK will increase its offshore wind in the Irish Sea by 50%, enough to power two and a half million homes. In Denmark, where the wind resource, by the way, is one-fifth, the wind resource in Ireland. There are 28,000 people employed in the wind energy sector alone. If you ask an investor today, would you invest your money in a wind farm in Ireland or in UK? Then you get a simple answer, UK, because the feed-in tariff is, high, is higher, and so the return on invest for these people is more attractive in UK and other countries. In the last uh, year alone, 15 major manufacturing companies have set up operations in the UK. Clipper, Multibrid, Siemens. Ireland is not attracting that in. We have a huge number of private investors, up to 14 billion worth of investment, waiting to come into the Irish sector from private companies, from foreign banks, from pension funds, waiting to invest in this country. 
We need visionary thinking from the new government just in place. We need the signals to go out there that Ireland is open for business. Why is Ireland far behind? For me there is no reason. Projects are realised all over the world for, for this technology, so just let's do it. If we are going to lead the world in this regard, we have to put meat on the bones. We have to make it happen with practical policies and real money has to be diverted to this instead of spending it on imports which are going to be used in other countries to make them rich. Ireland's future is, right now, quite literally, up for grabs. We have to rebuild our economy anyway. Going green could be our lifeline, the perfect solution. Becoming a sustainable country will substantially enhance our international reputation. Our children will have a better, cleaner future and a more confident country to live in. The rest of the world already think of us as the Green Isle. It's a very valuable brand to have. Now we have a huge opportunity of making Ireland a green, natural, organic and smart country. Doing so would also have a huge impact on our food and tourism sectors. Going green is not only about energy, it's about creating a new vision for Ireland. Take the food sector, for example. Producing great food is something that comes naturally to us, and yet every year we spend 5 billion euro importing food. We blow 600 million euro on meat, 300 million on dairy, 150 million on fish, and 850 million importing fruit and veg. Now that makes no sense. Farmer Mark Michel has been growing organic food on his farm in County Wicklow for 20 years. We import 70% of our food in Ireland at the moment, which I think is really scandalous. I have a lot of Dutch colleagues who come and visit the farm uh, regularly and they're kind of scratching their heads and they're saying, you know, what are you doing with this country? You, you should be exporting, not importing. Growing fruit and vegetables creates lots of employment and Mark's 63-acre farm generates 10 full-time jobs every year. Every million euro that we spend on Irish food creates at least 20 jobs. Ireland is one of those happy nations that has rainfall and a good climate and we should be utilising it and we're completely underutilizing our potential. I really believe that we are best placed in Ireland to nurture this green brand that Ireland has. We can all play a role by just buying locally produced food, by encouraging indigenous high quality low carbon foods. Tens of thousands more jobs can be generated in the farming and food sector. Another area that can benefit if we make Ireland greener is sustainable tourism. A recent poll of 22,000 in China, for example, voted Ireland as their favourite destination. By pulling together and focusing on making Ireland truly deserving of its Green Isle image, we could see far more tourists choosing to come here. And many of those 100,000 men and women who lost jobs in tourism in recent years could find themselves back at work. A green, sustainable, energy exporting and prosperous Ireland is within our reach. Some sceptics will argue that such a vision is beyond us. But the thing is, we've done this before. In 1925, the new Irish government commissioned Siemens to build one of the biggest projects in the world, a hydroelectric dam across the Shannon River at Ardna Crusha. At five million Irish punts, it cost a fifth of Ireland's GDP and instantly produced 100% of the country's electric grid supply. Our grandfathers had the courage to realise this amazing achievement at a time when the country was on its knees. Can we do the same now with the green economy? Or will we be looking back in five years' time to find out that we have done nothing while other countries leap forward? This is a very critical time for all of us. For our leaders and public representatives to begin imagining a new Ireland, an Ireland that is strong and resilient, that can employ our young people and give them a future. 
that can generate huge amounts of income from our green energy, food and tourism sectors. It is possible, but we have to make it happen. That was the final episode of this year's EcoI series. If you wish to see any of our previous episodes, visit the RTE Player or our website, earthhorizon.ie. Thanks for watching. Thank you.